Yo, what's up, Elevate? How we doing? I'm still here. I never left. Hey, um, it's been a tremendous week. We uh, have just been loving uh, what we've been learning as far as this idea of zeal. And we're looking at the life of David and just seeing the zeal that he had for God and how, how God was working through him because of that passion and how he used those times of waiting and, and God was blessing them. So here's what I want to do. I want to take just a minute here. I want to review the first couple sessions here. Here's from session one. Uh, Brad reminded us of these things. When it comes to zeal, we have to understand that God is working in the process. So we learned that um, when it comes to zeal, zeal doesn't waste the waiting. Maybe you're in a season right now of waiting just because you're a middle schooler. Like, hey, I can't drive yet. I have to wait till I have some freedom to be able to drive around and do what I want. I'm, I'm in middle school. I don't have the ability just to lead other people. Um, people don't really listen to me because I'm like 13, and I'm just in this season of waiting. Maybe you feel like you're there right now. Well, guess what? David's been there. He knows what that's like. He knows what it's like to be considered nothing. He was the youngest of all of his brothers, and he was considered so insignificant that his own father said, hey, we'll just leave you out in the field when, uh, when Samuel comes, and uh, you're not even get a chance to be uh, looked at as king. So he understands what it means to be insignificant, and um, he didn't waste the waiting, though. He took those opportunities to use his zeal for something like a harp, right? What could God do in you if you chose to use this time of the process and to develop a zeal for something, develop a passion, develop a skill, develop um, a desire for God. So much could be done while you are in that time of waiting. Next, uh, zeal asks, what's in my hand, right? So what is it that God's given you? Maybe it's a baseball, maybe it's an instrument, maybe it's a pen, maybe it's a MacBook, maybe God has given you something. Ask yourself that question. What is it that God has given me? What's in my hand? What is something that I'm good at? What is something he has provided for me? What is my platform? Where do I have influence with others? Is it on the team? Is it, is it with my friends? Do they listen to me when I speak? Do they actually respect what I have to say? And do I have influence in that group of friends? How can I use this time of waiting as I have zeal for God? Next, it sees the importance in the process. So don't waste the waiting. God is working in the process. And then Pastor Chris brought the word yesterday, and we looked at this idea of God's presence and his power as David came across his greatest challenge today, and it is Goliath. And there was a giant, but David had so much zeal, he said, nobody talks smack on God. Nobody talks smack on God's people. Something has to be done about this. And his zeal was contagious. He responded to mockery with action. He did something about it. Where is something going on in your life right now where, where there's mockery going on, there's something, and God wants you to take action. He doesn't want you to shell up. He doesn't want you to hide. He doesn't want you to be discouraged. He wants you to take action and actually do something. Instead of maybe just posting on social media, what if you actually went out and you did something? Instead of complaining, what if you took action and you went and served other people? Zeal rejects doubt with trust. Everyone around him was doubting him, but David had trust in God. He knew that he was going to be used by God because of the power of God, because of God's presence in his life. Rejects doubt with trust. He confronts fear with faith. I love how the scripture says David not only went up to that giant, but he ran at him. He ran at Goliath with that sling, that tiny little sling. And as he was mocking him, saying, what, are you, uh, what am I, a dog that you come at me with sticks? David says, no, I come at you with the power of God. I come at you with the Lord of, of, of Israel, the Lord of God's armies. And he defeats Goliath. God defeats Goliath. This was contagious. That zeal took an effect and it changed the environment around him. The same soldiers, the same people who were hiding under rocks, who were, who were just cowering before this giant, all of a sudden rose up with courage because that zeal was contagious. It had an effect on those around him. What if? What if your zeal for God, what if your zeal for what God's called you to do, what if your zeal for finding God's heart and learning more about God and reading his word and praying and get to know him and coming to church and being a part of this community, what if that zeal became contagious on your friends around you? What if you could actually go to school, you could sit on the bus, you could be at the lunch table and you could actually talk, get this, you could actually talk about the Lord in your life and it wasn't weird. 
What if you said, oh yeah, you know, I, I was reading this the other day in, in the Word, and this is what God, the way God challenged me. What if you could have a conversation like that with your friends? Could you imagine that? Maybe for you, you're like, I, that would be the strangest thing in the world to even talk about God with even my Christian friends. Or I go to a Christian school, and it would still be weird to talk about my faith. What if you had so much zeal that you couldn't help it? You couldn't help it, and it was contagious. Well, this morning, we are going to look at the next part of this series. We are going to look at patience. We're gonna look at patience. So let's pray. We're gonna dig into God's word. We're gonna find out what happens next in David's story. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, I, I just, I'm so filled with excitement for these students as they have the opportunity to be challenged by your word. And God, you have so much to share with them today. Would you get me out of the way? Lord, would you speak through me? And uh, would you just uh, touch our hearts and, and Lord, convict us in ways that we need to change and encourage us in ways that you want to, Lord. And I just pray that we would leave this morning and, and come back tonight just encouraged to learn more. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today's word is patience. Now, when it comes to patience... There is this, this thing I have that pops in my head, and this, it's a moment in my life, and it, and it recurs over and over again, and maybe you know what I'm talking about, but it's a moment in my life where my patience is tested, and it's a great test. It's, it's difficult to pass this test of patience, and in fact, the difficult part of this test is there are great consequences. Uh, I mean, you could really, really get burned, and I don't mean like you get burned in life. I mean, you literally could get burned. Look at this. What do you, what do you see on the screen here? Anybody know what that is? That is a hot pocket. It is a hot pocket, and it's called a hot pocket because it's a pocket full of hotness, okay? It will burn you. And if you don't know much about a hot pocket, first off, there, there's no health or nutrition involved. It's just pure grease and fat and uh, a genetically modified material, okay? But they are delicious, and they just slide down your throat into your gully, okay? And, and it, you know, maybe it's late at night, and you get home from a friend's house. You just need a snack and you pop in those like Tostino's pizza bites. Okay, they're like miniature versions of the greatness of a Hot Pocket. They even make Hot Pocket for breakfast. You know, if you wanna get your stomach sick in the morning, you can even have a Hot Pocket for breakfast. If not, you can have it late at night like I do, right before you go to bed, okay? And the great, the great thing about a Hot Pocket is it's delicious. The difficult part is when you bite into it, right? Now, the thing about Hot Pockets too is it's either like frozen solid in the middle or it's lava burning hot. And when you bite in, the roof of your mouth, you can't feel for like the next week. You know what I'm talking about. That is the joy, that is the risk in biting into a Hot Pocket. There's great risk, but there's great reward too, okay? Maybe you've dealt with the consequences of this. You can't feel the upper roof of your mouth. But the Hot Pocket teaches you all about patience. I don't have the patience to wait. I bite right into it as soon as it comes out of that microwave. But today, we are gonna learn from the life of David a lesson on patience. You see, David's life can really be summed up by waiting on the Lord, by being patient. We saw early on in David's life, he was selected to be the next king, right? And Brad shared with us what happened after David was anointed with oil and the prophet of God came and said, hey man, you are the next king of Israel. Okay, see ya. And the prophet packs up his bag and leaves. And guess where David goes? Right back to the field. Right back to his sheep. Right back to playing his harp. Right back to being nothing in his, his brother's eyes, in his father's eyes. The same person who God says, hey, I see zeal in your life. I choose you to be the next king. I see your heart. I don't look at the outward appearance. I choose your heart, and I want you to be my next king of Israel. God chooses him. But then he goes into this season of waiting. He's out in the, in the shepherd's field. He's out in the field until he fights Goliath. So he defeats this giant. He defeats this, this, uh, this Goliath in this epic battle. And what's the next thing that happens? That's where our story picks up today. Let's find out what happens to David right after Goliath. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And it says in verse 57, as soon as David returned from killing Goliath, Abner, that's Saul's right-hand man. Okay, he's the, the commander of Saul's army. Abner brought him to Saul. 
with the Philistines' head in his hand. Oh, dude, that's gross. In those days, they didn't have like trophies like we have today. If they won like a battle, they literally like shlunk, chop off the dude's head and like carry it around. Like, dude, look what I did. And Goliath's head must have been massive, okay? I don't know if he's stuck in a bag or what. It's gross. But he comes right before the king with the head of the giant. And after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. And there was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. And from that day on, from that day on, Saul kept David with him and would not let him return home. If I'm David, I'm thinking, finally, my time has come. God, you anointed me you, as the next king. You gave me this zeal for you, and I've been following you. I've been obeying you. I've been practicing my harp. I've been practicing my sling. God, you've used me in mighty ways, but when am I going to actually take that next step? When am I going to move from the process into the final product? And he finally has this opportunity to have some influence, to be around the king. And he meets this guy, the son of the king, and his son's name is Jonathan. And there's an immediate bond be between them. In fact, some versions, uh, translation of the Bible say that Jonathan's soul was knit to David. He was knit to David. Basically, these two become besties, okay? They are like the best friends you can imagine. Maybe you have a friend like that and, you know, you like show up to school wearing the same outfit. Um, you're like twinning or you're, you're, you just got that best friend and you game together at night maybe or, or you play in the same team together and you have common interests in just everything about that friend. You just connect with them on a different level. This is one of the greatest examples of friendships we see in Scripture. David and Jonathan. What's interesting to me is what happens in this next verse. Verse 3 says, Jonathan then made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. This is true friendship here. This guy's saying, hey, I love my friend as much as I love myself. I, I'm gonna sacrifice things in my life for him. And he makes this pact. It, this is like our version of like, okay, you know what I'm talking about? You ever do that as a kid? We don't do that in COVID world anymore. You know, we wash our hands and we, you know, we put sanitizer all over, take a bath in it. Uh, but, but, you know, when I was a kid, you know, you spit in the hand and you shake on it, okay? Or, or like when our grandparents were around, they like, they like, you know, put a drop of blood in their hand. It was gross, okay? But these guys make this pact with each other. I don't know what transpired or what happened, but they make this decision that, hey, we will be friends until the day we die. And unlike you and your first grade friend who you said, we're gonna be friends forever and you haven't talked to him in like 10 years now, um, these guys actually follow through with their pact. In fact, there are multiple times in the story where David and Jonathan reinitiate this friendship and say, hey, things have been tough. Let's, let's go back to our promise to each other. Let's reinitiate that promise again. Let's follow up with that. These guys have a tremendous friendship, but what Jonathan does next is a little bit outrageous. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe, his kingly robe, and giving it to David together with his tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. Now, this might not mean much to us, but in their day, that was really the idea that, that he was saying, I'm the prince, I'm the one who's going to become king next. David, I recognize your zeal for God. I recognize you are God's anointed. I recognize that there is something great going on here. In fact, it says after David talked to Saul, that's when Jonathan was knit to him. It's like he heard David talking about God, like David was telling Saul all about what God had done, and, and there was just something that struck a chord with him. He's like, this guy, he and I are like, we have the same passion. We have the same desire. We're in the same direction in life. We love the Lord our God with all our heart. And because of that, there was this immediate bond between them. Essentially, what David was saying is, hey, I'm giving you my armor. Or it was Jonathan was saying, I'm going to give you over my position. He was the prince. He was the next one in line. And if you're the king, if you're Saul, and you see your own son say, hey, you know, I'm supposed to be king, but you know what? Here. You can have this stuff. I see that you're gonna become the next king. If you're Saul, that doesn't sit right with you. That doesn't sit right with you. An observation that I made as I'm reading over this, it really struck me is David rejected Saul's armor earlier, right? David said, hey, I, Saul, I can't fit, stuff's all clunky. I'm not gonna wear this. He rejects Saul's armor. What does he do here? He accepts Jonathan's armor. There's something to Jonathan's character. There's something to Jonathan's calling. There's something to the zeal that Jonathan may have had that David said, you know what? 
I'm going to accept that. I'm going to accept that from you. And this friendship just continues on for the rest of their life. True friendship, though, true friendship doesn't compete or compare. It's our first point. True friendship in life will not compete and will not compare. Maybe you've been to that point in your life where you have somebody that is constantly comparing themselves to you. They're constantly competing with you. Um, tonight, you're the opportunity to compete with the other teams in our, in our epic uh, clash that we have going on tonight in our war games. But in this moment, that wasn't a time for competition. Maybe you've had a friend who's competing with you, or maybe you're competing with somebody, a brother or a sister. There's someone you constantly feel like you're just struggling with, and you're, there's this competition going all the time. When it comes to friendship, the friendship that God wants for us, there shouldn't be comparison. There shouldn't be competition. So what I have here is I have some marks of friendship. Here's some marks of friendship that we see, and they kind of play out through Scripture. We see them all throughout, things that I've learned in my life. But these are some marks of a lasting friendship. You want to have a friendship that lasts a long time? Pick people with these qualities. You want to be a friend? You want to be a friend that, that has a friendship that lasts a long time? Aspire to have these qualities in your friendship. These are, these are extremely important. A lasting friendship shares the same purpose. They have the same values and the same direction in life. When I was in middle school, I met a couple guys here at church. I was coming to youth group. I was out here like every Wednesday night. And uh, there were a couple guys, and, and we kind of connected on different, uh, you know, different interests. We like skateboarding. We like certain kind of music. Um, and, you know, I like to play basketball. And we like to have fun. And we connected on those things. But as our friendship developed, we all found that each of us had a desire to follow God's pattern for our life, that we didn't want to live the life that the world was living, that we wanted to, to follow after God with everything we had and the ability that we had, and we wanted to, to see where God's path led us. And that is what knit us together. In fact, uh, we are still extremely close to this day. Some of you guys know some of these friends of mine, even they, they are even a part of our, our church here. And I have these relationships that have lasted and tested through the years, and they've lasted, you know, 25 years because they hold up to these qualities. They share the same purpose, right? We all had a value, and that value was to live in God's pattern for life. They share truth in love. You want to have a friend, you want to be a friend that is able to share truth with somebody, not lie to them, not try to please them to earn their, their love, but instead you say, hey, man, I, I think that's kind of messed up. I don't think that's the right, well, I don't think God would want you to do that. And to do that in love, to do that with a pure motive, to be able to share the truth with them and to have somebody to do that with you. If you have a friend that shares truth with you in love, you've found a great friend. you found a great friend. Next, it's strengthened by trials. This kind of friendship is actually strengthened when difficulty comes. When there's some tension there, when there's conflict in the relationship, you work it out, you talk it through, and your friendship actually grows from it. You draw near to one another. Not only that, but when there's difficulty in life, when there's a trial, one of you is facing, the other one's praying for you. They're there by your side. You draw near to one another when life gets tough and the relationship is tested. And last, this is one of the hardest things to do. But if you can be a friend that celebrates the success of others, you will be a great friend. If you can have a friend and find a friend that can celebrate your wins and celebrate the joys of your life and they can, they can mourn with you when there's difficulty and there's loss and they can celebrate with you when there's success and God's doing great things, if you can find that kind of friend, that is a lasting friendship. We see this in David and Jonathan. In fact, their friendship will continue on for the rest of their lives together. Well, back to our story. The Lord is with David. It's so Nothing could stop his success. Verse five says, whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and by Saul's officers alike. Here's the point. David was loved by Jonathan. David was loved by the people. David was loved by even Saul's commander, Saul's officers, Saul's closest people. David was loved by everybody except for Saul himself. In fact, if David would walk in this room right now, I think his theme song would be like, all I do is win, 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 right? And everybody's hands would go up because David was the modern day equivalent. This is the best I could come up with. Go ahead to the next one of that guy, okay? If you don't know who that is, his name is Tom the Goat Brady. 
okay? He's got a lot of rings. That means he's won a lot of things, okay? Um, if you know much about his life, uh, this guy, he's like a model. He's married to a model. He wins every time he goes out on the field. This guy is walking success in the world's eyes, okay? No, I don't know where Tom Brady's heart is. I don't know if he loves the Lord with all his heart. Um, I, I don't know any of those things. What I know is in the world's view of what success is, everything this guy kind of touches turns to gold. And David was that plus 100. David was success walking into a room. Everything he did, he was loved by everybody. He was even loved by the ladies, okay? Check this out. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. Okay, they're coming out to meet King Saul. All right, we're going to celebrate. King Saul, you're the best. You won the battle for us. You're our king. We love you. No, no, no. What's it say? They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. I don't know, maybe they had castanets going on, okay? And this was their song. This is great. This is great. Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. I don't know the tune of the song. I don't know how it went. I don't know if it was a rap. I don't know, uh, reggae. I don't know. But all I know is they're dancing around the streets, and they're in front of Saul, and they're like, hey, Saul, you're, you're good. David's awesome, though. David's killed tens of thousands. David's killed the, the, the giant. He kills Goliath. He wins everywhere he goes. You can imagine this is the perfect recipe for jealousy. Well, as you can imagine, Saul didn't like this very much. This made Saul very angry. What is this? He said, they credit David for 10,000s and me only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. You see the next step in Saul's mind? The next step in Saul's mind was not that David would help him succeed as a nation, not that, hey, hey, this is great. We have this guy, David, who, who you know, God, God is just blessing him and he's blessing me as the king because everything I tell David to do, he goes and does and is successful. No, no, no. You see, Saul didn't see David as an asset to the kingdom. He didn't see David as a friend. He didn't see David as someone who was gonna help. He saw David as his personal enemy. The first thing that came into his heart was fear. Fear of losing the throne. Verse 9 says, from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. A jealous eye on David. In other words, he's watching for him. He's like, everything David does, I'm going to look and see what his motives, what's he trying to do. And he started planning things in his mind about what David was trying to do and, and, and what David would, was possibly trying to grab power and, and become the king. None of that was happening. But in Saul's mind, David was his enemy. There was jealousy. He had a jealous eye eye for David. But you see the root, the root and at the heart of things, the root of jealousy is typically, typically it's fear. Jealousy begins with fear. It begins with a fear of loss. In Saul's case, a fear of loss of influence in his kingdom, a fear of loss of his son's admiration. My own son is giving his, his throne over to this guy. He, he loves David more than he loves me, his father. A loss of his legacy. David's going to become the king, and I'm not going to have my legacy. A loss of people's approval. We know that, that Saul, throughout his history, we see that his, his, just, his uh, zeal for people's approval was greater than his zeal for God. He followed God at times, but when people pressured him, he caved in. He wanted people's approval. That was his number one thing. Maybe you're in that spot today. Maybe people's opinion of you is number one, and you have a zeal for it. It makes differences in how you post things. It makes differences in how you talk on the bus or at the lunch table. It changes the way you live. It changes how you act. When you're with your friends, you ch you're a totally different person than when you're at home. I know this is the case in middle school. I get it. I know this is a struggle. There's times where I, I see a group of teenagers together and there's just this, this mantra that you put off, right? Because you're with your friends. But when you're one-on-one, -on -one, you're a completely different person, right? Most people especially students, are kind of scared in their heart. They're kind of nervous to talk to people. When you're with a group of people, everything changes. For Saul, it started with the root of fear, fear of losing. But how about you? Maybe you find that you are afraid of losing your friend. 
There's a friend out there, and you're like, there's somebody kind of coming down your territory, and they're, and they're starting to become friends with them, and I'm afraid that I'm going to lose that friend. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose influence with that person. Maybe you're fearful that you're going to lose time with them. You're, you're fearful that you're going to lose attention of other people. You're fearful that, that you're going to lose what's fair in life. That, hey, there's something going on over here, and it's not fair, and I'm going to lose justice. The way they're acting, and they're getting rewarded, it's not fair. And I'm jealous of them because they shouldn't be getting away with that. They shouldn't have that. They shouldn't be elevated to this way. I know what they're really like. You have an eye of jealousy for them because you're fearful. But at the heart of it, at the heart of it, it's a loss of trust that God's going to take care of everything. What I have here is a question for you to ask yourself. Do you pass the jealous eye test? Do you have a jealous eye for someone else? right? A jealous eye sees someone, a friend maybe, as a rival. You see them and you compete and you compare. You don't look at their, the things that are good about them and celebrate them. You can't do that. You're too insecure in your own heart. You see them as a threat. They're a rival. And there's jealousy that turns into even, you know, resentment or hatred. Jealousy tries to control everything. Jealousy at the root is fearful, so it tries to control and it tightens the grip. Tightens the grip on things. You try to control everything. You try to manipulate situations, manipulate friends. That, oh, we're going to do this. Or, oh, she said this. Or, he, he's doing that. And do you know what he's really like? And you're manipulating things behind the scene because you're fearful of losing something. Jealousy wishes that you had it, right? That's that envy, that, hey, I just wish they had their popular. I wish I had their platform. I wish I had as many followers as they have. I wish I had the strength that they have. I wish I had the skill that they had. I wish I was on the team like they, I wish I was the captain. I wish I was as good. I wish I could sing like her. I wish I looked like him. I wish I was them. Then there's the dark side of envy, where jealousy takes another turn. Scripture tells us that jealousy, that envy is like, basically one step before murder. And what happens, we commit murder in our heart. Those people become dead to us. There's a hatred that that forms. And we get to that point, not only do we wish we had what they had, we wish that they didn't have it. In fact, we desire that they fail. We desire that God takes everything away from them. When they succeed, it hurts us. We want them to fail and we desire a resentment towards them. If that's where you're at this morning, first off, Join the club. I think we've all been in a moment in life where we were insecure about something and, and we started to build that kind of jealousy. But scripture tells us that is destructive for your life. Jesus doesn't want that for us. He doesn't want us to look at others and compete and compare. He wants us to be secure in who we are. He wants us to know that we can trust him with everything, that he's gonna take care of it. We don't wanna get to the point where Saul was. We wish they didn't have it. He's resenting David with a jealous eye. So what does Saul do? The only thing he can think of. What do you do with a problem? What do you do with a pest? You squash it. You get rid of it. The very next day, verse 10, the very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. I don't know what this looked like. I don't know if he, his hair was like all messed up, if he started like running around like an animal, but but what we do know from scripture is that this guy is just like all of a sudden out of control. Now we know from an earlier passage that God's spirit left Saul. In Old Testament days, God's spirit, God's presence didn't dwell on everybody who believed. Like today in the new, under the new covenant, guess what? You believe in Jesus Christ. In that moment of salvation, God's presence, his Holy Spirit, God the Spirit lives in you. And you are his temple. And God's spirit helps you make decisions. It's your conscience. It, it, it gives you the strength to do things. It helps you overcome fear. You've experienced this in your life. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have the presence of God. In the Old Testament, God's spirit came upon people and left people. He came upon people for a moment to accomplish a task. And then his spirit, he left. And in this moment, God's spirit was gone from Saul. We don't know what happened. We don't know if God sent a spirit or, or maybe, um, maybe a demonic force overcame him, but we know is that he is gonna try to kill David. David was playing his harp as he did every day. So here's David over here. Ring, ring. Over in the corner, he's playing his harp like he always did. Oh, hey, Saul, how's it going? Hey, man, yeah, cool. 
cool. Hey, Jonathan, what's up, friend? Yeah, love you, man. Yeah. Ring. And all of a sudden, Saul's just overcome with rage, okay? Saul had a spear in his hand, and he suddenly hurled it at David, okay? Intending to pin him to the wall. He's trying to pay, like, pin the harpist to the wall, not like pin the tail on the donkey. He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pin David to the wall. I'm gonna put the spear right through him. And he chucks it at David. But David escaped him, what's he say? Twice. I read that the other day. I'm like, I never read that before that he escaped him twice. So apparently he throws it at David and David gets away and then he like goes after him again. And David somehow escapes him twice. Here's the point. Your zeal may lead others to despise you. If you have a zeal for God, if you love the Lord, your God with all your heart, if you are after God's heart, you're chasing after him and he's called you to do something or he's called you to love other people or he's called you to be different or he's called you to live different and talk different and act different, guess what? That zeal is gonna get noticed. There might be people around you who hate you and despise you because you have a zeal for God, because God is blessing you, because God is elevating you and giving you leadership and giving you uh, places of influence. There will be people that hate that about you. Hopefully they're not throwing spears at you, but they will despise you. But what we learn about David is David kept doing what he was called to do. Even with all this resentment and jealousy, David never left Saul's side. He's continuing to play his harp, it says. David was playing the harp as he did each day. David didn't stop. David never stopped the grind. He always was just doing what he was supposed to do. Saul saw David as an enemy, but David viewed Saul as the Lord's anointed. He understood that even though he was an enemy to Saul, Saul was not his enemy. And what does scripture say about this idea of enemies? Maybe you feel like you've got enemies in your life, people who despise you, people who hate you. Maybe, uh, maybe you've been an enemy to somebody. Well, in the New Testament, Jesus has this moment where he's up on a hill and he's teaching to you know, thousands of people. And he says, hey, you've heard this said, but I say this. He says that on all different topics, but here's what he says on the topic of enemies. He says, you've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He's like, hey, that's typical, that's normal, right? We should love our neighbor. We should have love for people who are kind to us. But yeah, your enemy, you can hate them. That's what the world says. That's what culture says. That's what you've been taught, he says. But then he goes one step further. The next verse, he says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Whoa, 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 Jesus, time out. Like, I don't know if you understand what's going on here. They hate me. Like that girl despises me. She looks for opportunities to like take things from me. She looks for opportunities to destroy my reputation. God, she is an enemy. God, that guy, like there's so much jealousy and hatred. Like I can't win. Everything I do, they just are tearing me down. I feel like anxious even to be around them. They are an enemy of mine. God, I, I want you to destroy them. Would you just like smote them like the Old Testament days, God? Like just get them out of the way. No, no, no. What does Jesus tell us? Love your enemies. Love your enemies, pray for them. Pray for those who persecute you. I wanna challenge you this morning. If there's someone in your life who you view as an enemy, maybe they're even in this room. Hopefully it's not like your friend next to you, okay? Maybe there's someone in this room who you think of as an enemy. First off, I wanna challenge you. Are you comparing and competing? But if you're the other end of that, what if you took a moment, what if you said, I'm gonna start praying for them. I'm gonna show them love, I'm gonna show them kindness. I'm gonna start praying for that person who sees me as their enemy. That's what God wants us to do. Well, let's continue in our story. So Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with David and he had turned away from Saul. Finally, Saul sent him away and appointed his commander over a thousand men and David faithfully led his troops into battle. Again, David's just continuing to succeed. All he does is win. And David continued to succeed and he did for the Lord was with him. Why was David succeeding? because he had a zeal for God and God was with him. It wasn't because David was awesome, it was because God chose him as his instrument. David's zeal for God changed his relationship though, for the better or for the worse. Here's the point, here's our next point. When you have zeal for God, it's going to change things and it will change your relationships. You might have a friend who's no longer your friend anymore because you have drifted apart because you're following after God and they're following after success. You're following after God's path for you and, and, and you're trying to love other people and they don't think that's cool. They're like, now nah, those people are weird. 
when you have zeal for God, it's going to change your relationships. It can change them for the better. All of a sudden you start to establish these other friendships and relationships with people who have the same mission and the same purpose and the same zeal for God. And you follow up to that and you're building those friendships. However, there are people who will not like it. Zeal for God will change your relationships. You have to take account, take into account that there is a cost for following God. There's a cost for the zeal you have for him. Well, Saul recognized this. Saul recognized this and he became even more afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah, again, loved David because he was so successful at leading his troops into battle. Well, over this span of time that David is, is with Saul and around Saul, there are, there are seven attempts on David's life throughout his life. Seven attempts that Saul tries to kill David. He tries to get David's son in on an attempt to, to assassinate him. He even goes to David's wife, which is Saul's daughter, okay? And tries to have her be a part of this assassination. There's all this stuff going on. And David finally realizes, hey, I'm loyal to my authority. I'm loyal to my king, but like I'm one step from death, he tells Jonathan. I am one step from death. I need to take myself out of the situation. So David flees into the wilderness. And this kind of time is like that. It's kind of part of these wilderness years. So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Oh, that's cool. Soon his brothers and all his relatives joined him there. And then others began coming. So David escapes and he's out in the wilderness in this cave. And guess what? All these other people start to kind of trickle out into the wilderness. Like, hey, I heard David's out there. Well, like Saul, Saul's been kind of hard on me and, and I'm not really happy with my place in life. I'm, maybe David can be my leader. Maybe I'll follow after David. I, I've seen zeal in his life. I'm gonna allow David to be my leader until David was the captain of about 400 men. So here's what we have. David all of a sudden starts collecting this band of misfits, okay? I don't know if you've seen like the movie Mulan, but like there's like a group of like six or seven characters that follow Mulan around and they're like this kind of band of misfits and somehow they defeat the whole you know, Chinese ar or the uh, Hungarian army or whatever. And, and there's this band of misfits. That's kind of what we got going here. And you're gonna see this in the show tomorrow with David's mighty men. How God takes these men and these people that are following him and he does great things with this band of misfits. But David's out in the wilderness. He's out in the wilderness. And this is what we call the wilderness test. This is what we call the wilderness test. Wilderness, being in the wilderness puts your zeal to the test. Maybe you found yourself in a moment of life where you feel like, hey, I'm kind of out here. I'm, I'm being put to the test. My zeal is, is being tested right now. And it's kind of in this difficult place. And you find yourself in this feeling of wilderness. You're like, I'm not necessarily where I want to be. I'm kind of in another season of waiting right now. And I don't really know what to do with the zeal God has given me. But the good thing about the wilderness in the Bible is that every time God sends somebody into the wilderness, they come out a different person. Every time he sends his people into the wilderness, they change and they follow him and they come out saying, you know what, God, we're going to renew our faith in you. You see, the wilderness puts zeal to the test. The wilderness trials that David is going to go through, they're going to put his zeal to the test to see if it's real. Is your zeal real? Well, go out in the wilderness. Find out. Maybe the wilderness for you is, is, is being on a different team. Maybe the wilderness for you is losing all your friends that you thought were great friends. Maybe the wilderness for you is for people that are doubting everything you do because they don't understand why you have this desire to follow after God. It's gonna put it to the test to see if it's real. If he comes out the other side, then it is. The wilderness test is, is where you learn to trust. Difficulty leads on dependence on God. So when you go through difficulty, when you go through trials, guess what? What do you do? You depend on God. When everything's good, you stop praying. When you're in a trial in life, what do you do? God, I need you. I don't know what to do. You depend on God when you're in the wilderness. You depend on God when you're going through a trial. What else does it do? It builds courage. Difficulty leads to dependence on God. And we see even in Psalm 27, a lot of the Psalms that David wrote were in the wilderness. Was He's running away from Saul and he develops this, this relationship even stronger with his God. The last thing, the wilderness test requires patience. It can be times of waiting on the Lord and finding peace in his goodness. So as we head to the last part of our story here, uh, I wanna kinda say that, that David was in the wilderness for many years. We don't know exactly how long. But in this time, he didn't know when he was gonna become king. He didn't know when, when 
God was going to deliver Saul over. He didn't know if Saul was going to kill him, but he trusted in God's word. He trusted that God was going to pull him through this. God was given the opportunity to build influence with, with his men. God was doing so much in his life, but it was difficult. Thankfully, we have the Psalms where we can actually read what God was doing in the heart of David. I challenge you, take a minute, uh, take an opportunity over the next couple of weeks, open up your Bible to the Psalms, read through. David is very raw. He tells everything what's going through. There's times where he's doubt. There's times where he's, he's at, by the end of the Psalm, he's trusting in God again, but he's very real. God was doing something in his heart, in the wilderness. What does God want to do in your life? Maybe you are in that moment of wilderness, but there was another test that David would have to pass. Let's jump over to the authority test. We already heard this account of how David was in the cave and, and Saul and his men come up and they have him trapped in there. Saul goes into the cave. And what does David do? He has the opportunity right there. You know, Brad and I were talking about this earlier. We said, I don't know what I would have done. Like if there's someone who seven times tried to kill me, like at that point, I'm like, I'm chalking that up to self-defense. I'm like, I'm taking this dude out, okay? He is done. And he has the opportunity. Saul doesn't know he's there. He has the opportunity to kill Saul, to get rid of his enemy and finally take the kingdom, finally take the throne that God was rightfully giving him. But what does he do? He doesn't take that opportunity to kill Saul. His conscience bothers him. And what he does not said, he trusts God's timing. David, in that moment, was being put to the test again. He was having to pass the authority test. If you have zeal for God, you're going to have to pass that next test. It's called the authority test. Let's jump to that slide. The authority test. What does the authority test prove for us? When we have an opportunity, we have zeal for God, and we find ourselves bucking up against authority in our life, whether that's a parent, whether that's a teacher, whether that's someone in, in leadership, we find that authority. We often want to kind of jump over that or take control because we have zeal. We have passion for God. We want to do the right thing, and, and they're not doing it the right way. In those moments, God wants you as middle schoolers. He wants me. He wants all of us. He wants all of us to be able to pass the authority test with our zeal. Here's what it meant for David. The authority test was a test for his respect for God. You see, when I honor my authority, I'm honoring God's way. Let's go back one, one to our, our verse on authority. Romans 13 says this about authority in our life. Everybody must submit to governing authorities. Everybody. Wait, really? What if I don't like what they say? Everybody must submit to their authorities. Why? Well, for God, put them there. For all authority comes from God and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Well, God, they're, they're stupid. I don't like them. I don't like what they stand for. They're idiots. God allowed it. God put them there. God has a plan. He has a purpose, and he wants us to respect the authorities we have in our life. Even when we have zeal, even when we don't agree with our authorities, God wants us to respect them. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against God, what God has instituted, and they will be punished. So go back to the authority test. He was leaving it in the Lord's hand. David passed the authority test. He goes to that mouth of the cave, and what does he do? He does something inconceivable. He gives the position away of his men, and he holds up that piece of cloth that he tore from, some, from Saul's robe. And he says, hey, Saul, guess what? I could have killed you. But in that moment, what he does next? He bows. He bows before Saul and says, my father. He literally calls him my father, my Lord. He says, I would never do this against you. I have no ill feelings toward you. I just want to serve you. Why are you chasing after me? And then he says, guess what? I'm going to leave it in the Lord's hands. I'm going to let God judge between you and me. God will be the judge. And in that moment, for a brief moment, Saul actually repents. And Saul's, you know what? You're right. And Saul goes back to his palace. David goes back to his encampment. And there's a peace between them for a short time. But David passed the authority test. He left it up to the Lord. He says, the Lord's my advocate. He'll protect me. Last thing, the ultimate test of trust is that authority test. Waiting on the Lord's timing instead of trying to take it into our own hands. This is what patience here is all about, saying, God, I have zeal for you. I want to go do everything you called me to do, and I, I, just, I, just, want to, I just want to love you, God. And, and there's people in my way, though, and there's things that I want to do, and, and, and i gotta, I got to take things into my own hands. No, God wants us to trust him and put it in his hands, in his timing. Here's the point. Here's our big point for today. Zeal must be tested to prove that it's real. Your zeal for God, your zeal for what God's placed in your life and, and the passion he's given you, that must be tested to prove that it's real. 
Here's three lessons for today as we wrap up here. Three lessons about zeal, or four lessons when it comes to patience. Four lessons. Zeal is marked by confidence, not comparison. When it comes to friendships, we don't need to compare with other people who maybe have more zeal than we do, or, or maybe uh, they don't have the same zeal well. We don't have to compare. We can have confidence in who God made us to be. We can have confidence in, in what he's called us to do. We don't have to compare. We can be friends and, and not enemies. Um, zeal is proven in the testing times. Zeal is proven in those times of wilderness. When we're out there and it's difficult and people are pushing back against us and they don't believe in what we stand for, zeal is tested in those times. If your zeal for God is legit, if it's real, it'll pass that wilderness test. Zeal honors God by honoring authorities. Zeal doesn't try to jump over the authority. Zeal says, you know what, God, I trust your timing. Just like David said, God, I'm gonna trust. I'll be out in the wilderness for 10 years if I have to. I'm not gonna try to make myself king. I'm gonna honor the authority you place in front of me. And last, zeal waits on the Lord's timing. Guys, God has given you something. He's given you, hopefully, a passion and a desire for him. He's maybe given you something that you can do in the waiting and develop a skill, something that he's placed in your hands, but you gotta pass those tests, the wilderness test. You gotta pass the test of the authority test. If your zeal makes it through that, guess what? It's gonna be refined. It's gonna be powerful. It's gonna be influential, and God will use you in mighty ways.